The issue before us tonight is whether to approve Proposition 1, which proposes two distinct changes to elections for most public offices in Idaho. First, the measure would abolish Idaho's party primaries and create a system in which all candidates participate in a top four multi-party primary. Voters may vote for any candidate they wish, regardless of party. The top four vote getters for each office would then advance to the general election. Second, the measure would establish ranked choice voting in the general election, in which voters mark rank the candidates on the ballot in order of their preference. The votes are then counted in successive rounds, and the candidate receiving the fewest votes in each round is eliminated. The votes for those eliminated candidates are then transferred to the voter's next highest ranked active candidate. The candidate with the most votes at the end of the final round is declared the winner. Debating in favor of the initiative is Luke Mayville, spokesperson for Idahoans for Open Primaries. Luke is the... Luke is the co-founder of Reclaim Idaho, known for its successful 2018 Medicaid expansion ballot initiative, which was approved by over 60% of Idaho voters. Debating in opposition to the in initiative is Trent England, founder and executive director <laughs> of Save Our States. He also serves as co-chairman of the Stop Ranked Choice Voting Coalition and is the David and Ann Brown Distinguished Fellow at the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Thank you both for coming tonight, and thank you for flying in from Oklahoma to, to do this. It's really important. I appreciate it. Our debate will be in the Lincoln-Douglas debate format with arguments in favor and against, cross-examinations, a round of rebuttals, and closing arguments. I want to note that Nathan from Boise State University will be our timekeeper tonight. He will be holding up a yellow paddle to uh, note when you have 30 seconds remaining in your time and then a red paddle when your time has expired. So keep an eye on Nathan. We are gonna to begin tonight with the case in favor of the initiative. Uh, we're gonna start with six minutes on the timer and Luke Mayville, you will begin six minutes uh, in favor of the initiative. Well, thank you so much, Scott, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, a couple of months ago, I met an Idaho teacher uh, and we got to talking and she asked me what I do and I told her, well, for the last several months, I've been going around the state advocating for this thing called Proposition 1, this ballot initiative that would create open primaries and allow for ranked choice voting. She immediately got very excited, uh, and she told me that her students uh, study these reforms. And she said, oh, wow, open primaries, ranked choice voting. Uh, we have an entire lesson on, on these ideas. And my students love them. They really prefer them to what we have now and they really understand them inside and out. And I was very impressed and I responded to her, wow, that's, that's really impressive that your students are so engaged. They really understand inside and out. You must teach like a college prep course or a maybe 12th grade government. She said, no, I teach sixth grade. <laughs> um, and I, I tell that story just to illustrate that this is a simple idea. Proposition one is a simple, common sense idea, and importantly, it is a solution to a very clear problem that we face in Idaho. That problem is the problem of the closed primary election system. Because we have closed primary, thank you, Be because we have closed primary elections, we are blocking 270,000 voters from participating in the state's most important elections. That's not just a problem for those voters who are being blocked. It is really a problem for all of us because it turns out that when you block so many voters from participating in the process, you end up electing candidates who do not represent the broader community. They only represent that small sliver of the population, that 20% of voters who participate in closed primaries. So I just want to say a word about the two parts of this reform. The first part is the open nonpartisan primary. And in that part, all voters, regardless of party, will participate. It will give freedom to those 270,000 independent voters to freely participate in the most important elections in our state. All candidates will appear on the same ballot. So imagine you're voting for governor 
there might be four Republicans, two Democrats, two independents, all on the same ballot. There's no ranking in the primary. All you do is just choose your favorite candidate and you go home. It's a much simpler primary system than what we have right now in Idaho. The second part of the reform is what happens in the general election. The top four candidates all go forward uh, and it doesn't matter which party they're from. And all you do again is you can choose your favorite candidate if you want to. If you choose to, you also have the freedom to rank them one through four, first choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice. And once you've done that, you go home. And it's so important to realize how simple that process is. Be and, and, and opponents of Proposition 1 will say this is impossibly confusing for voters to understand. What we've been hearing all across the state is that this is about as simple as counting to four, this process. Uh, now, the only part that is a little more unfamiliar to people is how are the votes counted, but here's exactly how it works. In the very, the, in the very first part of the counting, just the first choices are tallied up. If then and there someone gets a majority of the vote, they're declared the winner. That's what happens most of the time in these elections. But if no one gets over 50%, there's a second round of counting. And what happens is that the last place candidate gets eliminated. If that was your favorite candidate, your vote now goes to your second choice. I'll repeat that quickly because if you understand that one thing, you understand the whole process. The last place candidate gets eliminated. If that was your favorite candidate, your vote now goes to your second choice. That process just repeats. The third place candidate is eliminated. If that was your favorite candidate, your vote goes to your next choice. By the time there's only two candidates left, whoever has the most votes wins. And if any point along the way someone gets over 50%, they're declared the winner. Now, as you can see from that process, there is a, an important underlying value behind ranked choice voting, which is that ranked choice voting guarantees that the winner has broad support from the community. You cannot win a ranked choice election with just 30% of the vote or 20% of the vote. Or like now in the closed primary where you can win with about 9% of the vote. You've got to actually show that you have broader support in the community. And whether it's the open primary part of this reform or the ranked choice voting part of this reform, we can see that there is a basic principle underlying all of Proposition 1, which is that every Idaho voter, every taxpaying citizen deserves a voice in our political process. And we deserve leaders who are accountable to every voter. Thank you. All right. Trent, you are going to have an opportunity to cross-examine Luke. So you get three minutes to ask him questions and cross-examine his argument. Very good. Wait, I, I don't know if this, I've ever done this in a debate before, so I'm, other than maybe in high school. So I'm excited for the format. Thank you very much, Scott. Thanks to the statesman for putting this on and, and to call oh, me on the loop. Oh. I don't, uh, it was on. I checked no. it. Oh, you want to just pass? Yeah. yeah. Just, just we're not, we're not rigging this we system. Go. We're not. <laughs> So, so Luke, you, you mentioned uh, that RCB guarantees broad support. You talked about a majority. Does that mean that if in, an, in a theoretical RCB election, if 100 voters participate, that you can only win if you have at least 51 votes or not? If you, uh, if you, uh... <laughs> if you listened closely, which I, I think you did, but it, but you if go back and watch the tape. I did not actually say the word majority. I said the broader community because I know there is a technical reason why sometimes the winner of a ranked choice election gets say 48%. Okay, very good. Thank you. So this is, this is an important point. Um, in in ranked choice, ranked choice voting plays a little bit of a bait and switch because it, the folks, folks who are pushing ranked choice voting claim that uh, you have this high turnout because you count the people who, who show up first, right? I mean, that's the turnout in a ranked choice voting election. When, when people talk about, when people who are pushing ranked choice voting talk about turnout, you're talking about the people who cast a first place vote, not the number of voters at the end, right? 
Yes. And the numbers go down in every, in every, I mean, in every real ranked choice voting election, those numbers get smaller and smaller. The denominator goes down, right? This is true. However, what the research shows is that even though this is true, however, what the research shows is that even if a winner can end up with below 50% of the total vote, it tends to be 45% or higher, which is a whole lot more than winning an election with 9%, which is what happens in a closed primary. Okay, so no, that, that, I think that's very helpful for, for where we're going later. Um, another question I wanna ask, and I think, I think you suggested that you do care that voters understand the tabulation process, but a lot of folks pushing ranked choice voting say that that really doesn't matter, that all voters need to do is just understand the ballot and I, I feel like you, you sort of said both things, right? Does, uh, oh, there we go. This will make it easier. <laughs> I mean, does it matter to you that voters are able to understand the tabulation process or is that really irrelevant? Sure. Um, we've had, a, oh, am, I, am I going through here? I'm sure. Set on. Uh, check, check, okay. Um, just in the past, you know, 15 days, we've done about 17 town halls all across the state. And every single time we've talked in detail about the tabulation process, we're doing as much voter education as we can to make sure people really understand it. And we find that once people hear the basics of how it works, they find it really to be really simple. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we are now going to move on to the arguments against the initiative. Trent England, you're going to have seven minutes to present your case. Thank you very much. So as someone who grew up in, a, in, in the Northwest in a neighboring state, um, I, I know that Idaho is special, right? Your, your, your mountains, your rivers, your forests. I remember driving into Idaho as a kid and just the, the, the smell of the forest for some reason is a, is a vivid childhood memory. But as special as Idaho is, when it comes to democracy and its discontent, Idaho is not special. Neither is the United States. When we look out around the world, People are frustrated with government. Some people are frustrated because they see government as captured by elites, and this is driving the rise of populism. Other people are concerned about the rise of populism, and they see this as destabilizing our government and threatening to, to sort of create a doom loop that gets out of control. I think all of these concerns are legitimate, but I also think they prove one thing, that Idaho's primary election process, or general election process for that matter, is not the problem. <laughs> because when you look at a lot of these countries, they have very different electoral processes than we do, right? Um, and, and so the idea that we're gonna solve, if, I mean, if this is the motivation, and, and I, it seems to be, right, that our politics is, is breaking down, it's getting out of control, it's changing in ways that we don't like. Well, the first thing we ought to do is look at other places where this is happening and understand what might be the cause and what can't be the cause. Because the cause can't be something that isn't shared across all of these places. And when we look at a lot of these places, they don't do elections uh, the way that Prop Proposition 1 would, would have us do elections. It's, I, I just, I, I've worked in this space for over 15 years, and I've learned to be concerned about the one neat trick, right? The, the one easy fix, the silver bullet that's going to solve everything, right? And I, I think that Proposition 1 gets, gets peddled that way. Uh, so let's, let's talk about Proposition 1 in detail. Um, the first thing we know, and, and, and Luke, I think, acknowledged this, is that it does make elections more complicated. And that, in turn, does make elections harder to trust. Do we really think that now is the time that we should be doing that? Uh, there was a study that MIT did that found, uh, quote, that ranked choice voting, quote, produced significantly lower levels of voter confidence, voter satisfaction, and ease of use. It also found that ranked choice voting, again quoting from MIT, increased the perception that the voting process was slanted against the respondent's party. Now, of course, you know, some people can say, I mean, you, you can rightly say that can't be true, right? It can't be slanted both ways. You've got people saying this is benefiting the other party and people in the other party saying this, right? But it gets to an, a problem that we have in elections, which is that elections can't just be fair and honest, right? Elections have, actually have to be better than that. They have to be demonstrably fair and honest, right? We actually have to win the public's trust 
with the way that we hold elections. And, and by the way, I'm going to reference this MIT study probably through through the the uh, the whole program. The folks who push ranked choice voting have some studies of their own that they paid for. Oftentimes they ask people questions that, to my mind, boil down to, are you smart enough to do this? That's a loaded question. They get the answers that they want. MIT did both uh, survey research and experimental research, which, which basically line up. It's a, it's a paper worth reading if you're interested in this. Um, so, so let's go through Proposition 1 and the ways that it would change elections. Remembering that not every voter is a political wonk, right? Those of us in the, this room, probably mostly political wonks, right? But not every voter is excited to vote. One of the most common reasons cited for not voting is that people feel like they don't know enough. And that's right now in our simpler system. So with the all-candidate primary, you pick one from what might be a list of uh, dozens of candidates. Right? There have been examples where there's dozens of candidates. There have also been examples where there's only one or two or three. Um, but, uh, uh, but oftentimes it's, you know, eight, 10, 15 candidates. Uh, the winner might have a very small plurality of the vote. A political party might exercise the discipline to put forward just four candidates and stand a chance of sweeping the primary, having only Democrats or only Republicans go on to the general election. Uh, they can do this more easily if the district leans their way, but they can also do it if the district leans the other way. If they run four candidates and the other side runs 10, and all the candidates distribute the votes among themselves relatively equally, right? It's not particularly likely to happen, but it can happen under this system. You can wind up with just one flavor of candidate making it to the general election. Then in the general, Proposition 1 has a different election system altogether. One system for the primary, another for the general. One ballot design for the primary, a totally different ballot design for the general. Pick one out of maybe dozens in the primary, then rank uh, up to four out of four in the general. And they're labeled by party, but the candidates just make that up. It has nothing to do with whether they're really a member of that party or endorsed or nominated by that party. It might be true, it might be inaccurate, it might be intentionally misleading. Proposition 1 allows that. Now, ranking the candidates means you have a lot more bubbles to fill in, many more ways to make mistakes and spoil a ballot, and the whole process takes more time, which was another finding by MIT, but it's also just common sense. Longer lines at the polls, more strain on poll workers, physically longer ballots, using more paper, taking more time to scan. And, and it's, it's very challenging uh, for visually impaired voters who, who use auditory voting systems to vote. Uh, this is something I found a lot of ranked choice voting advocates just have never even thought about, right? There are people who have a hard time voting, or can't vote um, with paper and pen, and uh, adapting the system to, to their needs is very challenging. Idaho's Secretary of State found that implementing ranked choice voting would cost taxpayers $40 million, which is hardly surprising considering it's a totally different, more complex, slower tabulation process entirely dependent on technology. All the data for each election must be centralized. Tabulation can't begin until all ballots are received and processed. Then you feed all the rankings into the black box and hope voters trust the results that come out. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, we don't have to theorize about what could go wrong because uh, there are other places that have tried ranked choice voting. It's interesting. It seems like a new idea only because so many of the places, most of the places by my count in the United States that have used ranked choice voting have gotten rid of it. Uh, starting in the first half of the 20th century, lots of places have tried RCV and, and have, uh, have eliminated it, um, including Utah has a pilot program right now, and uh, half the towns that have tried it have pulled out early. But California does, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to my, my example of, from, of the California field election later since I'm out of time, um, but, but it's enough to say these aren't theoretical concerns. Um, we've seen real failed elections caused by this kind of a system, and I'm sure we'll talk about that more. We'll have more time. Okay, Luke Mayville, you now have three minutes to cross-examine uh, Trent England on his points. Okay, now I'm starting to see a little bit of a pattern uh, in the debate so far, which is that uh, we can really get down into the weeds about some very specific technical issues with ranked choice voting. I think there's a problem with that, Number one, because as we'll go on uh, in, in the next several minutes, I think we'll find that on every one of those technical questions, there's a whole lot of misinformation out there. There's a whole lot of exaggeration out there. But the bigger problem 
with this tendency to go deep into the weeds is that we lose sight of the main issue, which is that in Idaho right now under a closed primary system, 270,000 taxpaying citizens are denied the right to freely participate in elections that their tax dollars pay for. Um, so I wonder, you said explicitly, you said Idaho's primary election system is not the problem. What do you say to that taxpaying citizen out there who says, I should not be forced to join a political party to exercise my right to vote in the most important elections in Idaho? It's, it's no different from a voter who says, look, I, I don't live in Boise, but I work in Boise. I spend my weekends in Boise. The things that happen, the decisions made in Boise have a lot of effect on my life, and they'd be right. So I want to vote in Boise even though I live in Nampa, right? Uh, we, there are limits <laughs> to whom we can vote for. If you're a Republican, you get to vote on who the Republican Party puts forward as a candidate. And in Idaho, granted, right, I used to live in Washington State, it's the other way around. You know, in Idaho, there are a lot of places where the person the Republican Party puts forward winds up being elected in the general election. But there's a general election, they are elected. America has a problem. Right. It's a larger problem than politics. And some people call it the bowling alone problem after the famous book from a few decades ago. People people want to have their cake and eat it, too. Right. If you care about who the Republican nominee is, well, roll up your sleeves, go talk to your neighbors and get involved in the Republican Party. And the same thing for Democrats. If you're not willing to do that, don't sit back and complain that you don't have a voice. That's my answer. OK, I'll come back to that in a moment. And my rebuttal is coming up. Get excited. <laughs> But uh, I'm excited. But the uh, but I just want to just uh, we're still in the cross examination. So the MIT study that you cited that you said you're going to come back to over and over again was that done with people who actually voted in a ranked choice voting election, or was it done with hypothetical voters in a lab? It was it was both. It was they they did survey research and experimental research for that. Okay, study. my understanding is that it was in a lab. Um, and the let's see. Um, the black box that, that you said votes get sent to a black box. Do you really believe that it's a mysterious algorithm of some kind, or do you think it's a pretty simple process of how the votes are counted? I think it fails the BS test, which is the bus station test. That is that if, if you take this system, you go down to the bus station and you explain it to people, and then you say, okay, you turn around and explain it to somebody else. I think a lot of people have a very hard time describing what's going on in the system. And I think that's why when people first started pushing ranked choice voting in the U.S. 100 years ago, their answer was, it's simple, not because the tabulation is simple, but because the dumb voters don't need to understand it. I, I think that's wrong. I think a, a, a democratic election system is one where voters can understand what their votes mean and how they're counted. Okay. You are going to get four minutes for a rebuttal. So go ahead. We'll start the clock at four minutes for a rebuttal. Okay. Well, let's start with that last point that somehow there's a, a black box that your vote gets thrown into and it's calculated by a mysterious algorithm. Uh, it gets kind of silly at times. One of the legislators down in the Capitol called it a logarithm at one point. Um, it is not a mysterious algorithm and here's exactly what it is. And I think you can, you know, explain this at a, at a bus stop. The candidate who comes in last place gets eliminated. If that was your favorite candidate, your candidate goes to your next choice. That's it. That's the mysterious algorithm. That just repeats a few times. And the moment that someone gets up over 50%, they're declared the winner because, remember, we want candidates who actually have broad support from the community, not just from a tiny group of primary election voters. So there's no black box here. The idea that this is confusing for voters to understand, again, it's really about as simple as counting to four, and that's part of the breakthrough of the Alaska system. We're not putting 13 candidates on the ballot and asking voters to rank them. We're putting four candidates on the ballot and giving voters the option to rank them. And when they conducted surveys in Alaska and Utah, they found that well over 80% of voters who participated found the process simple and easy to understand. Um, the idea that this somehow s uh, favors one party or the other, no evidence for that. 
in Alaska where they rolled out this reform, it passed, the voters passed it in 2020. They had an entire election in 2022. They elected, a lot of people don't know this, including a lot of the opponents don't know this, they elected the same number of Republicans and the same number of Democrats as before. It was never about electing more candidates of one party or the other, and that's not what it's about in Idaho. What it's all about is electing candidates, regardless of their party, who really do represent the broader community and are accountable to every citizen, not just that tiny group of, of voters who vote in the closed primary. The idea that it's satisfactory to tell these voters, these tax-paying citizens who are being blocked from voting in closed primaries, that you can simply sit it out and vote in the general election, I will tell you, you will not satisfy Idaho voters with that, with that argument. Because everyone in Idaho understands that the election that really matters in Idaho is the primary. So if you're blocked from voting in the primary as a tax-paying citizen, you're really shut out of Idaho politics. Now, the idea um, that this is bad for um, voters with disabilities, that's just not found in any real evidence. There's people claim that. But in fact, when they rolled out this system in Alaska, they were able to make accommodations. They were able to make the same types of accommodations for voters with disabilities uh, as, as is done um, under the current system. Uh, so I'll stop there for now. Okay, you have six minutes to respond. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me get back to the California example and then I'll, I'll comment on some of the things that, that Luke has mentioned. Uh, because I do think it's important to not just have a theoretical conversation about this. Um, so Alameda County, this is where Oakland is. They use ranked choice voting in their county elections. They had a school board race in Oakland that had three candidates, 26,432 voters. So not a big election, right? This is not one of the more complicated ranked choice voting elections. But it was a disaster. And how do we know it was a disaster? Just dumb luck. That's all. Right. But for dumb luck, the wrong winner would be serving on the Oakland School Board. So what happened? So first, 235 voters got confused, I guess, or refused to use the system the, the way that, uh, you know, the, the, the geniuses who came up with it wanted to be used. 235 people didn't rank someone first, but did rank someone second and maybe third. This is a mistake you can only make with ranked choice voting, right? You can't make this kind of mistake in other systems. And as somebody who's worked on election policy for a long time, I can tell you, you know, wants like us, right? We, we vote, we know if we spoil our ballot somehow, you know, we spill coffee on it, we can get another one, right? And we're, we're dead set on voting. So we'll do that, right? We will go to the county courthouse, we will figure it out. If we think all voters are like that, we're just being elitist. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. 235 voters made this little mistake. The uh, second, the county staff running the ranked choice voting election was confused, thanks to ranked choice voting. They were supposed to, the computer was supposed to be programmed to shift those second place votes up to be first place votes before the first round of tabulation, but the computer was programmed incorrectly to ignore them in the first round and then count them in the second round. You know, ranked choice voting makes this an issue. It's not an issue in regular elections. It is an issue with ranked choice voting. There are all kinds of different ways to interpret these, these problems. Third problem in this uh, cascading cavalcade of ranked choice voting failures is just the lack of transparency, right? That's why I call it a black box, not because it's some mysterious algorithm, right? Um, but because it is a black box, right? It's, it's hard to see inside it and understand what's going on. And that's what happened in Oakland, right? Everybody did what Luke wants us to do, right? Just trust the system. Don't ask questions. Don't worry about it. They didn't. Some researchers, some academics were doing a paper on ranked choice voting. They happened to get this data, rerun the numbers. And on the Friday before Christmas weekend, they called Alameda County and said, you know what? All of your ranked choice voting elections that went to multiple rounds are, are wrong. All of them. Alameda was actually really lucky that it, you know, these, these are relatively small changes, right? But they cascade through these rounds of tabulation. It only changed the result in this one race. But it took four months, it took a court order to straighten this out. And again, it was dumb luck because ranked choice voting is so non-transparent, nobody knew. 
that there had been a mistake in a three candidate election with 26,000 voters, right? I mean, we should at least be concerned, right? And, and I, I get frustrated when you hear things like, oh, you know, there's just, we shouldn't worry about unintended consequences. We shouldn't count the costs, right? I mean, of course we should, even if it's a good idea, especially if it's a good idea, we should at least be honest about the concerns, right? I mean, uh, you know, otherwise we're just shooting ourselves in the foot, which is what they've done in Oakland. There's now a serious effort to repeal it there because of failures like that. The, the other example is Alaska. There's only one state that's actually done this, and that's Alaska. It passed narrowly in 2020, funded almost exclusively by out-of-state groups, <clears throat> similar to here. Those groups won't tell you that in 2022, Alaska had record low turnout, or that Alaskans are likely, it seems, to repeal ranked choice voting next month. Nor will they tell you that ranked choice voting has led to both parties manipulating the system by limiting the number of candidates, either by controlling how many candidates file for office or getting candidates to drop out after the fact. I'll give you one example, but there's lots. You can go to Alaska's NPR affiliate. They've written about this. So Alaska's congressional race this year, 12 candidates in the primary. Uh, the winners were the Democrat incumbent and three Republicans. But to improve their odds, the Republicans did what the Democrats had previously done in order to flip the seat. They had their less popular candidates drop out. That elevated a candidate from the Alaskan Independence Party and another Democrat, Eric Hafner, who is currently serving a 20-year prison sentence for threatening to kill a judge, a prosecutor, a police officer, and his family. And just a few, years, uh, just a few days ago, the New York Times suggested that Hafner could, quote, play the spoiler under Alaska's ranked choice system. Again, right, the idea that this is a system that can't be gamed, can't be manipulated, anybody who claims that, right, hasn't been around politics long enough. Of course, it's, the question isn't, can it be gamed, can it be manipulated? The question is how, right? And how does it compare to our current system? The fact is, with ranked choice voting, candidates who win beyond the first round, what Luke mentioned, oftentimes, it's just irrelevant, right? Somebody has overwhelming support in the first round, they win. I think this is another thing going on in Alaska, Right? They were promised a bunch of choices in competitive elections, and they got elections that, frankly, look a lot like the elections they had before. Winners that look a lot like the winners they had before. Right? They didn't get transformational change in the way their, their politics works at that level. They just got a more complicated system that takes a lot longer and seems to suppress turnout. But uh, um, I think I'm almost out of time. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to stop there rather than launching into another section and getting cut off halfway. So, All right. We'll still have closings. Yeah. Uh, but you, Luke, will have three minutes to respond to what he said. Okay. Well, we have an example of what I had mentioned earlier here of really attacking Proposition 1 by going through detail by detail. Uh, the, about the first half of this whole last section was about just one detailed ex, you know, example in Alameda County, uh, we can go through detail by detail, and, and, we'll, and let's do a few of these. So Alameda County, the basic problem was simply that an election administrator chose the wrong setting on the tabulation equipment. That was, that was a human error that was not the fault of ranked choice voting. It was a human error and that's what the post analysis has shown. And that type of human error could be done under our current system, something very similar to it. We had an election here in Idaho uh, last cycle where people thought it went to candidate of one party and then, and then a few days later they said, whoops, we, we misplaced some of those, or something happened and we, now we figured out it actually went to the candidate of the other party. It's human error. Just a few weeks ago, we had some ballots go out in a few uh, counties in Idaho that didn't have the full Proposition 1 on it. It's human error, right? It happens under our current system, and you can cherry pick times when it happened under ranked choice voting, but that doesn't prove that there's some fundamental flaw uh, in ranked choice voting. And you go through these, all, all of these um, attacks that really get in the weeds. The idea that there's some serious problem of spoiled ballots. And because, rank, again, the, the notion that ranked choice voting is somehow confusing for people and that people will therefore be way more likely to spoil their ballots. Well, in Alaska, 99.9% .9 of the ballots were valid. You did not see a serious spoiled ballot problem in Alaska. The idea that somehow ranked choice voting 
will be more likely to lead or, or top four primaries or open primaries for that matter will be more likely to lead to, you know, what you could call eccentric candidates. And you mentioned one of them uh, in Alaska. I think most people here will agree that we, we have some eccentric candidates in Idaho's <laughs> elections already. And the important thing about Proposition 1 is that if a candidate is a really fringe candidate who does not represent the values of the broader state or the broader community, they're really highly unlikely to win under Proposition 1. Whereas in the current process, where you can win with 9% of the voters in a closed primary election and then sail the victory in the general, you can be the most fringe candidate and still eke out a victory and, and make the laws that we all have to live under. I'll stop there. All right. <clears throat> we'll now move to closing arguments. Each uh, debater will have three minutes uh, to make their final case. And Luke, we're going to start with you. You've got three minutes to make your final case for why uh, voters should approve Proposition 1. Well, there's this idea that by moving to a top four open primary with ranked choice voting, that we're doing something really strange and innovative and out of the ordinary and that after all the system we have now is tried and true, it goes all the way back to our founding, right? We hear this a lot out there. The truth is, uh, sorry to break it to you if you really love the closed primary, they didn't have closed primaries in the founding era in the United States. We haven't had closed primary elections for 240 years. We've had closed primaries for 12 years. 12 years. Before that, for over 40 years, we had a much more open system. And the truth is that throughout American history, we've had this tradition of reform. Where you go state by state, there's so much variety across our states in the election laws that we have. In fact, the United States Constitution sets it out plainly that it is the role of the states to set up their election system. And throughout history, we've done that. And in the best tradition of our reform, of, of our reform movements in this country, we've always tried to live up to one basic guiding principle. And I, I'm, in my view, that goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence, which said very clearly that government must be based on the consent of the governed. The consent of the governed. That means a system where every voter, every citizen has a voice. It does not say in the Declaration of Independence that government is based on the consent of one small group of voters who show up in a closed primary. It says the consent of the governed. That's what we're trying to do with Proposition 1. We're trying to restore the voice of all voters in Idaho, every taxpaying citizen, regardless of your party, regardless of, you, if you, of if you even belong to a party. And we're trying to make sure that the elected officials who represent us are accountable to every voter. Thank you. All right, three minutes for your closing. Statement. Thank you very much. I agree with Luke. We have had a lot of reforms in the US, um, particularly political reforms over the last 50 years. And I suspect that if we had a longer conversation, we would probably agree on a lot of the problems that we face as a country that you all face here in Idaho, right? I find that in these discussions with folks that are advocating for ranked choice voting, usually, I'm, I, usually I agree with a lot of the observations about the challenges we face in our politics. But one of the interesting facts is that when you talk to people who really understand the course of some of these reforms, some, not all, but some of the problems that we face today are a result of the previous reforms that made political parties weaker and therefore less effective 
and, and therefore more prone to capture by fringe minorities rather than to, to be, as American political parties are at their best, large diverse coalitions, right? That have a tradition of incorporating Americans into our politics and serving as mediating institutions. Fundamentally, a, a big part of my concern about reforms like this is that I think they double down on past mistakes that aren't fully understood, right? As we have weakened our political parties, Americans have said, well, I don't wanna be a part of political parties. Now, as I mentioned, bowling alone, right? There's, a, there's I think, a larger problem of social breakdown and, and the fraying of our, our, uh, our mediating institutions generally. But this is a reform that suggests that we can sort of push the easy button and uh, somehow get the results like we used to have when, frankly, we had um, more limited uh, party nominating processes, right? It used to be that parties, you know, just the central committee or something even smaller than, uh, than like a caucus system would nominate candidates, right? And I mean, if we like our Lincolns and our FDRs, right, and, and candidates from that era, uh, then we have to acknowledge that something about that system seemed to produce statesmen. I, yeah, why that is, people can debate, right? Um, we have only had primaries, right, really widespread for, you know, about 50, 60 years, um, some, places, some places longer than that, going back to the progressive era. But uh, the, the idea that we're going to make things better, if I'm right, and one of the problems we have is that our parties have become weaker and have atrophied, the idea that we're going to make things better by making our parties even less relevant and encouraging them to atrophy even more is doubling down on past mistakes. It is going to make things worse. And we'll be standing here 20 years from now debating another round of well-intentioned reforms without understanding that the problems we face 20 years from now will be partly a result of changes like Proposition 1 that, that seek to convince people that there's some easy solution, that we don't have to rebuild our institutions, but we can just you know, push the easy button and wave our problems away. Thank you so much. All right, thank you both. Thank you both for that. Um, we do have a number of Boise State students um, in the audience, and I think there are a couple of students who have a question or two. All right. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ethan. I'm a senior at Boise State studying political science and psychology, and I had a question for the gentleman on the right who is arguing in favor of Proposition 1, um, which actually relates to what we just heard from the gentleman on the left. So something that we've learned in political science classes is that as parties have grown weaker, um, you see more radicalism in the candidates in those parties. And so I was wondering if you could respond to the argument made by your opponent that we need to strengthen our parties because that might produce more moderate candidates instead of changing our election systems. So the, check, check, are we yep. going through? Okay. Um, this question of the future of the political parties is one that I'd love to personally engage a lot more on and maybe we could talk more about it offline at some point. But, uh, but the, it, it is a real issue, right? We want there to be well-functioning parties in our political process. Throughout history, parties have played an important role. I think where we'll disagree is the idea that, you know, party, there's something special about parties right now that this reform will somehow change or that this reform will take us in the wrong direction. It may be, it may be true, and it probably is, that this reform won't make parties stronger. And those who want to do the work of revitalizing our political parties they're not gonna do that through this particular reform. Maybe they have to go work in their political party and, and do everything they can to make that happen. But as I think Trent acknowledged, we're not living in an era of strong, well-functioning political parties. Sometimes strong, but strong in, the, in a bad way, oftentimes. And certainly not doing the good work that maybe if you look in other eras of history, we associate with parties. Here in Idaho, for example, uh, a very common complaint, and in in a one reason why so many Republicans across the state support Proposition 1, is that the current, much of the current party leadership does not represent the broader community of Republican voters. 
and that the preferences of the average Republican voter is much different than what the party leadership is putting forward. So the party is failing at that basic historical function of mediating, as Trent said, between the ordinary citizen and their government. The party seems completely out of touch with the ordinary citizen. Uh, the last thing I'll say about that is that even though Proposition 1 takes that function away from parties of nominating the one candidate that can go forward for, to the general election, it does take away that function. It does not uh, eliminate the most important function of parties, which ultimately the most important function is to go out and organize like-minded people around a common agenda and then go out and try to win votes for the candidates uh, that, that the party believes in. The party can still do that under Proposition 1. I'll respond. I'll just say, uh, I mean, uh, there's lots of things I could say, but you're right, it's more like talk over a beer. Um, I think where where I would disagree is, uh, and, and I, I get this from the Federalist Papers, I think the, the best book ever written about politics is the Federalist Papers. And, uh, and that's because it analyzes policy in terms of incentives, right? It, it's, it's a thoroughgoing examination of public policy in terms of the incentives that, that are created. And I think that any reform, right, the real question is how does this shift the incentives and how does our political ecosystem reorganize around those incentives? And I, I think that um, for the parties, clearly, right, this takes away some of their power. You acknowledge that. Um, and I think the the other, and it, and it is something, I mean, to, you know, to your, to your credit, to the credit of everybody advocating for Prop 1, um, some of the talk is about incentives and trying to incentivize voters and, and candidates to act in different ways. Um, I, I don't think we've seen that in the places where it's been tried. And I also think that this, this downside for parties is something that, also, I mean, we just don't have a lot of data because because Maine is is uh, young and, and a, you know in a different slightly different model and Alaska is very young and, and uh, only the only similar model. But uh, uh, no, I just I think we really have to consider those incentives, right? It's not enough to say well people should you know I kind of said this before people should roll up their sleeves and get involved. People should, but we need to we need to shape the incentives so that it makes sense to do that. Any other questions? Um, hi, so I'm a student here at Boise State and I think that a lot of the issues that like students feel like we have is that we are underrepresented in politics and we've had like this very consistent same coalition that's been elected over and over again. And oftentimes we go to the state house and we just don't feel like we're being heard. So I feel like my question for you guys is, do you feel like proposition one would help or hurt students? Who wants to go first? I'm, I'm happy to start. Uh, I mean. The one word answer is help. And uh, the longer answer is that, look, what we're seeing in Idaho is what we're seeing all across the country. And it relates to this last question. A lot of young people, probably the majority of young people, whether it's in Idaho or across the country, are feeling this problem of weak, disconnected political parties or, or sometimes parties that are too strong in the wrong ways and and weak in other ways. And young people have lost confidence in parties. So the majority of young people are unaffiliated. Um, so when you talk about the closed primary that blocks unaffiliated voters from participating and forces them to join a party in order to exercise their right to vote, it's really a problem for any group out there that is disproportionately independent, right? Well, and that's and that's military veterans, for example. It's also young people. Uh, so this proposition is really going to restore the voice of all independent voters, and that includes a lot of young people. And it's going to mean that you show up and freely vote in whatever primary election you want to vote in. And not only that, it's going to mean that the, the typical general election in Idaho is actually going to be competitive for the first time in 30 years. 
That doesn't mean that a candidate from one party or the other is more likely to win. That's going to stay about the same. We predict that typically Republicans are going to win elections at about the same rate as they do now. And, and Democrats are going to have similar challenges that they do now. But as a young person, you're going to be able to show up to that general election and actually weigh in on who ought to win. And it won't be obvious when you show up who's going to win before you even cast a vote. because you might say, oh, it's probably going to be Republican, but you won't know which Republican. And you, as the voter, will be able to look at the different Republicans on the ballot and Democrats and independent or third party if they make it through. You're going to be able to evaluate them and say, which of these candidates best reflects what I need to see government do? Which of these candidates best reflects my values? And right now, as a young person, when you show up to vote in November, I, I, will, I will always say, before I say what I'm about to say, I'll always say, please still vote. Every, always vote. But we all know that the big decision happened in the primary. And that by the time you get to that general election, it can often feel meaningless when you show up to vote because you already know who's going to win. And if Proposition 1 passes for the first time in 30 years, we're actually going to have competitive general elections. And that's that's... A pretty big deal. Okay, Trent. So, I don't think that's what we're seeing in Alaska. I mean, again, I, I like to look to the real data when it's available, and the, I mean, it's just not empirically backed up, and it, it also doesn't. You know, and I, I uh, was very involved in politics for a long time in Washington state um, under different systems. You know, obviously they have top two and uh, I mean, their politics changed a lot. Uh, the, the political system changed a lot while I was there. And uh, I just, I just think that again, you know, the, the idea that this top four ranked choice voting system is, is good forever. I mean, I've heard this, I've heard this system sold to libertarians. It's going to be great for third parties. Um, there's no there's no evidence of that. I mean, there, there is evidence that, that people are slightly more likely, again, from the MIT study, uh, it's the only thing that they found where ranked choice voting promises were, were sort of kept, right? That, that five to six percent of people were more likely to vote for third parties. Those candidates still didn't win. Um, so I, I'm not sure what kind of a benefit that really is. Maybe over time it would, it would change things. Like, I'll, I'll grant that. Um, but this idea that... Um, that suddenly young people are going to matter more and Democrats are going to benefit and Republicans are going to benefit and, you know, everybody's going to benefit. I, I just, you know, I, at least for me, I don't know about the people in the room, but for me, my ears sort of start perking up at that, feeling like I'm being sold something that clearly is, is being oversold. And, and frankly, you go online, you can find people who were very excited about ranked choice voting 10 years ago when, when this was first being pushed by Unite America and Fair Vote, some of these DC organizations. And, uh, and they have sort of come back and said, look, we, we still think this is a good idea, but it's clear it just doesn't live up to the hype. And Alaskans are finding that out right there they don't have a different, fundamentally different legislature than they had before. And as I said, a lot of these top four general elections are winding up being not top four because you can game this system by manipulating the candidates that wind up. I mean, the very first time it was used in the congressional special, there were three candidates because the Democrats had the other Democrat who claimed to be an independent, but he was a Democrat, drop out after the ballots were printed. So there was one Democrat, two Republicans. The Republicans had to fight against each other and the Democrat won with, with not majority support from all the voters who participated in the election, which actually is, 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 the, uh, is the usual outcome for ranked choice voting when it goes to a second round. You don't actually win with the majority of the voters who participate. We're finding that out too. So I just don't... I just don't, I mean, for young voters, right, that the, the answer is um, get involved, get engaged, and also recognize that, you know, we talk about blocks of voters as if they're all the same. I mean, young voters are as diverse as older voters and, you know, every other big voting block. So, you know, I think a lot of young voters probably feel like they're heard and other young voters don't. And, uh, you know, it's, we all have to work to be heard. That's our system. Great. 
All right. Well, thank you for those questions and thank you for the uh, th thoughtful answers. Appreciate it. Uh, I want to wrap up uh, by thanking again Luke Mayville and Trent England. Thank you for, for coming out and doing this and, and having a great debate. And I want to thank Boise State University and the Institute for Advancing American Values. And I don't know if you're aware of all the great stuff they're doing, that they've got this great uh, Dialogue for Democracy uh, series going on. They do have an event coming up uh, on Monday, October 21st, uh, at the Bishop Barnwell uh, um, room at 3 p.m. on Monday. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Scott Bedke and Representative Alana Rubel will talk about the presidential candidates and their qualifications, Trump or Harris. And then I'm sure everyone in this room has already heard that David Brooks is coming to Boise State on uh, Friday, uh, October 25th at 7 p.m. at Extra Mile Arena. It is completely free. I've been told the parking will be free at the Extra Mile Arena parking lot. Uh, great event, great, great opportunity to, um, to listen to a really great uh, columnist, New York Times columnist, David Brooks. Um, and then I also want to give another plug to City Club of Boise, which brings people together just like we did tonight uh, to talk about diverse issues and hear varied viewpoints. You can learn more about City Club at cityclubofboise.org. Tonight's debate was recorded and will be available after the event at idostatesman.com and on our social media channels. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight to listen to tonight's debate. And for those of you who are uh, watching at home, um, I hope you found tonight's debate educational and helps you to make an informed decision when it comes time to vote on Proposition 1. Thank you all and good night. Thanks. 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 Thanks.